here's a topic that gets me really excited as a clinician who treats patients with bipolar disorder. What's the real world data about what dosages of medications help keep our patients well and also safe? I really enjoy the process of helping patients get out of their depressive or manic episodes, but keeping them well is just as important and rewarding for me. In psychiatry, there's a general tendency to stick to the adage, what gets them well keeps them well, and a reluctance to touch meds that have helped someone get better. But is there data for that approach or would something else be better? I'm Kristen Raj for the Psychopharmacology Institute, and this is Quick Takes. So to dig into this today, we're drawing on a nationwide Finnish study that looked at real-world patients over the course of more than a decade. It was published in Acta Psychiatrica, and it has some really interesting findings about how to get the best outcomes for your patients with bipolar disorder. This study challenges some of the conventional thinking about medication dosing for bipolar disorder. It suggests that when it comes to many of the commonly prescribed medications, Higher doses don't always lead to better long-term results. Okay, so let's break this down. We're talking about both antipsychotics and mood stabilizers here, the kind of medications that many of us are prescribing regularly. What exactly did this study find? It looked at the relationship between different doses of these medications and the likelihood of relapse, which they measured by psychiatric hospitalizations. The key takeaway is that for most of the antipsychotics and mood stabilizers they examined, like olanzapine, risperidone, valproate, and lamotrigine, sticking to the standard dose versus a low or high dose seemed to be the sweet spot in terms of lowest rates of psychiatric hospitalization. I was personally impressed that carbamazepine as well, at around a moderate 400 milligram dose, really hung in there with the rest with lower rates of relapse. That will also bring us to the question, though, of who exactly ends up on these medications and at what dosage, but let's get to more on that in a minute. You might be wondering, were there any medications that stood out in terms of efficacy or dosing? Yes, aripiprazole showed a noticeably low risk of relapse at low and at standard doses, the lowest relapse risk among all the antipsychotics they studied, which included olanzapine, ketiapine, and risperidone as well. This is particularly interesting because aripiprazole is not great at treating bipolar depression, but this research might suggest it's good at preventing relapse in general, a potential advantage for aripiprazole. What about the other end of the spectrum? Any medications that didn't perform as well as expected? Yes, unfortunately, ketiapine, which is often prescribed for bipolar disorder and has demonstrated efficacy in treating bipolar depression, it didn't show a reduction in relapse risk at any dosage in this study. Now, effectiveness is crucial, but we can't forget about the other side of the coin, safety. This study also looked at non-psychiatric hospitalizations as an indicator of potential medication side effects. What did they find? Well, most of the antipsychotics studied were linked to an increased risk of non-psychiatric hospitalizations at all dose ranges, but even more so at higher doses. The exception was aripiprazole at lower or standard dosages, which was pretty neutral in terms of association with non-psychiatric hospitalizations. The mood stabilizers at low to standard dosages were also relatively neutral with risk. But here's something I find particularly noteworthy. Lithium, which, as you know, is a mainstay in bipolar treatment, at low to moderate dosages was associated with an overall decreased risk of non-psychiatric medical hospital admissions. On top of that, lithium was linked to a decreased risk of relapse at all dosages. I've personally long favored the use of lithium in many patients with bipolar disorder because of the great data in treating mania and preventing mania during a maintenance phase. Its dual efficacy here makes it so straightforward to start prescribing it during mania and then keep it on board long term as well. I've also found individual patients to have great response and tolerance overall to the medication, so it's really nice to see even more data pointing in the direction of this efficacy and safety especially in comparison to other drugs. 
Of note, this study looked particularly at dosages of lithium as well as Depakote, though in clinical practice, we more closely want to be following blood levels. This study does really impact how we think about lithium's risk profile despite concerns about its potential longer-term impact on renal or thyroid function. Fortunately, for many of the concerns about lithium, these things can be monitored easily at least twice a year with standard blood lab work. There is a major limitation to looking at real-world data like this, which I alluded to earlier and really needs to be highlighted. As you've probably seen in your own clinical practice, Patients who end up on higher dosages of medications are often just the more sick patients. They may have a more severe form of bipolar disorder or have other psychiatric comorbidities. So those patients with higher dosages of medications who then relapsed, it's a very real possibility that they relapsed because of an inherently more difficult to treat disease state versus anything to do with their medication dosage being on the higher end of the range. What does all this mean practically for clinicians managing patients with bipolar disorder? I think it reinforces the approach to first, get patients well at the dosage of medication that they individually respond to. Titrate the medications to efficacy in your patient within the entire range of safe dosage prescribing, which of course we want to balance this against side effects that might emerge as dosages increase. After they're well and they're out of that six-month window after getting well where they're at the highest risk of relapse, then see what you can do. Perhaps first start slowly tapering down their medication until they are at a more moderate or low dose range. Or if they took catiapine to improve their bipolar depression, after six months of remission, one might consider cross-titrating catiapine for another medication that seems to have more optimal maintenance data, as both aripiprazole and lithium demonstrated in this study. I also personally really advocate for the use of lamotrigine as a maintenance drug to prevent bipolar depression episodes longer term, as it's both quite effective and well-tolerated. Throughout this whole process, carefully monitor the patient's response and look for continued stability in their mood, lack of emergence of symptoms, and any signs of side effects. This study also wasn't able to examine some of the newer antipsychotics with demonstrated efficacy in bipolar disorder, such as lorazidone, cariprazine, and lumetepirone. So keep in mind that these medications are still ones to consider for your patients, and they have overall demonstrated more favorable side effect profiles than some of the older antipsychotics in terms of metabolic side effects like weight gain and elevated blood sugar. It remains to be seen if these medications would result then in fewer non-psych hospitalizations on a large population-wide scale. To recap what we've learned today, when it comes to medications for bipolar disorder, standard doses can often be the most effective and safest option long-term. Aripiprazole seems particularly promising in preventing relapse, while the effectiveness of catiapine over a longer term is potentially limited. Lithium, a familiar friend in bipolar treatment, continues to demonstrate potential benefits beyond mere mood stabilization. Its effectiveness might even positively impact overall health. Carbamazepine and lamotrigine are also great under prescribed mood stabilizers to consider, especially in a maintenance phase. As we wrap up, the key takeaway is to approach medication dosing with caution and a personalized mindset. Monitor closely for both efficacy and side effects. And don't be afraid to adjust the medication slowly downward once a patient is in a maintenance phase as needed. That brings us to the end of our Psychopharmacology Institute quick take into medication dosing for bipolar disorder. I hope you found it valuable. Until next time. (music) 